Is the battery okay? Oh, this is on. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a, <clears throat> a waveform that looks like this, okay? You're going up, ramping up like an aircraft. Aircraft is taking off, something like that. And there is a little bit of cruise here and then coming down, okay? I think I put here 60 seconds, one minute. Huh? And then it's coming down. So, so this is the kind of waveform that people use to understand dwell fatigue uh, in fatigue crack growth, fracture mechanics specimens, or low, low cycle fatigue specimens also. Those are the two type of specimen configurations we use to understand dwell fatigue. At least that's what we have done so far, okay? And uh, there are some, I made some uh, mark, remarks here that dwell fatigue, what is dwell fatigue? So it refers to the reduction in fatigue life. So you know that there is a fatigue life by regular cycles, but when you put that whole time, you find that the fatigue life goes down, of a component goes down, okay? As a result of exposing the component to a constant high mean stress, okay? During cruising, between the ramping up and taking off, taking off and landing. So that, that load cycle that you have, the dwell time that you have there, okay, is what can bring down the uh, fatigue life reduction, okay? And you can change that, you know, you can change that mean stress back and forth, up and down. So the, this cold dwell fatigue, it's cold in the sense that in titanium alloys, it can take place around 120 degrees Celsius. 120 degrees, it's pretty cold, cold temperature for a, for a turbine engine. It's relatively cold, right? And it's a 40-year-old problem. And it was first observed in some titanium alloy disks, okay? Uh, not the turbine disks, but fan disks. In the Rolls-Royce RB211 engines, I don't know exactly what they are, the Lockheed TriStar aircraft, okay? So, oh, here I wrote again, the cold dwell fatigue refers to the phenomena that happens at temperatures approximately 120, 100, 100 degrees C, but it's more 120 degrees C or less in a relatively cold part of the engine. And we're talking about titanium alloys here. You know, we're not talking about aluminum or something, we're talking about titanium, but that's pretty low temperature for titanium, right? 120 degrees is quite low for titanium. So this is a serious problem for the producers and operators because the inspection intervals that we have, we need to check the, the fan blade and the compressor blade and all, the, all those inspections we have to do periodically. But when you have a problem like this, you're obviously, you're worried about how your disc is doing. So periodic inspections you know, are required and the replacement of rotor components, which is same as disc components in which cracks are detected. So this can happen. This used to happen and it still happens every now and then. And it leads to the over design of discs and blades. So it makes the engine more heavy because you don't want to take a chance, right? And then, uh, let's go. sorry, I didn't arrange these this morning properly because I didn't know exactly the flow of this, this would be. For this class, I thought I should just kind of go slowly, gently a little bit. Let me pull this up. Uh, okay, here we are. Um. <clears throat> So we all know that you know, cyclic fatigue you know, gives rise to fatigue fracture much below the yield stress of the material, which we already know that. And uh, it, this remains an unsolved engineering problem till today. So this is a very recent slides I made. This is still an, un we, we were trying to do this when I left and they're still trying to do the group back in uh, Air Force, uh, in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They're still trying to do that. Adam Pilchak is the guy on the metrological factors affecting cold vent, well, they are known in the sense that we have a lot of data, but we don't know, actually. I should put here, I uh, should change this line to the metrological factors affecting cold well fatigue. The data on this is, there's a lot of data exists, but how to put the whole story together is not very clear yet. I think that should be the way the wording should be. So the mechanisms 
for this phenomena are less clear. Hmm? And then uh, let me pull up the third one. Uh, please bear with me. I'm sorry about this going back and forth. Uh, experimental observations. Yeah, that's perfect. So the experimental observations are titanium-6-4. I'm actually surprised that titanium-6-4, <coughs> but near alpha alloys are the most affected. Like anything like uh, titanium-6 aluminum, titanium-6242, 811. These are near alpha, means there are more alpha content than beta, more aluminum stabilizers. They're very well fatigue sensitive, okay? But you will also see that uh, these type of alloys also have a high degree of crystallographic texture. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And in specimens that exhibit a preference for crystallographic slip. Okay? So, um, okay. Let me just go back now that we have some more audience here. Let me just go back. Okay? So we just started to talk about dwell fatigue. Huh? We just started to talk about, I know it's hot out there. <laughs> It's very hot. Yeah, dull fatigue, uh, humid. So this was the, we, we, we were talking about like a aircraft ramping up, cruising, and ramping down. And you can have many more cycles like that. And then we were saying that, what is dwell fatigue in terms of life? It means a reduction in fatigue life, reduced fatigue life. And uh, because of exposing the component or the sample in the laboratory to a high you know, level of mean stress, okay? Uh, and then simulating something like a cruise, I mean, ramping up cruise and, and uh, coming down, ramping off. And uh, it's, a, it's a old problem, it's a 40 year old problem where we find that um, it happens that at low temperatures like 120 degrees C and for alumina, I mean for titanium, 120 degrees C is not very much, as we just said. And then it happens in the cold part of the engine, so that's like fan. And uh, it's a serious problem because the NDE inspections have to be done more often, and the designers have to do more, you know, uh, over design, over design, so that nothing breaks. So we design more uh, to, on the safe side, so the engine can become thick, I mean, the engine can become heavier because we, we're using a, whenever we say heavier design, I mean, over design, we mean thicker. So the part is this thick. If you're having a problem, just increase the thickness of the part, gauge, gauge thickness. So, so the same loads would be applied on a bigger thickness. So the stress will be down. Yeah? So that's over design. That's how you overcome uh, under design by over designing it. And then, uh, well, the first statement is very obvious. I mean, that should be the first statement at the beginning of the class, actually. Cyclic loading, you know, we know that it's the stress is much less than the uh, yield stress of the material. So there's no plastic deformation. And cold dwell fatigue, uh, is, it is an engineering problem. And also, I think it's a scientific problem also. Although the operators get affected, the pilots get affected, but in reality, it's still a scientific problem. A lot of papers are there. I mean, people are still working. You know, they, they work very sporadically. Every five years, eight years, people get excited. They publish a few papers, and then they say, oh, this cools off, and then again, it's like corrosion. You know, everybody wants to work. Oh, there's a problem, there's a problem. Everybody works, and ah, oh, okay. It's, and then they start again. Exactly the same thing here also. Uh, so here are some observations. And we said that before you just came, we were saying that near alpha alloys like 6242, with silicon or without silicon, if you put silicon there, 0.2% silicon, it's more a weldable alloy. We add silicon sometimes to this six aluminum, two vanadium, four zirconium, two tin or something, right? And then the titanium 811 uh, alpha beta, near alpha alloy with beta phase also there. And these are very crystallographically textured, means they show a lot of planar slip. That means they show a lot of planar slip. The, the dislocations move in a planar slip. They're very textured. And also, texture comes from a different place, which we will see. You already know that, but I'm going to point it out. And there are also a lot of micro-texture. So there are, what they are finding is that there are regions in this, in this, 
in these alloys where there are micro regions in these alloys which are very highly textured. They're happening you know, in, in locations uh, inside the material. This is one guy from General Electric, Cincinnati, Woodf Andy, Andy Woodfield, who said that the microstructural features controlling the dual response in alpha beta process titaniums 6242 include size, shape, and volume fraction of MTR, micro textured regions. Okay? Micro textured regions, the same thing, MTR. Okay? Size and density of primary alpha grains. So he's one of the guys, I think back in the 80s, maybe. His paper is available in the literature, Woodfield, and it's a good paper actually. And then Kasner et al. also showed volume fractions of primary alpha. 6242, increasing volume fractions of primary alpha 6242 resulted in large dwell debit. So what that means essentially is that if I plotted the loss in life, the loss in life, I, can, I should make up a graph there. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll put it on, uh, would it be okay if I put it on this paper? And then we can transform it afterwards to, to uh, oh, thank you, Amit, yeah. Okay. Ooh, it's not. I didn't take it out of my bag, so okay. This will work, right? Yeah. So, uh, so percent loss in fatigue life. So this is dual fatigue. Personal law in particular versus percent uh, alpha volume fraction. I don't know how the curve would be, but just let's put it like a dotted line. I don't know exactly it will be like this or like that. So just so that we don't take a risk, we'll just put something, you know, we'll just stop it here somewhere. Maybe 10, 20, 30, okay. volume fraction. So something like that. So the person, more alpha you have, more you will lose uh, in the dull fatigue, right? So, so this is also dull fatigue debit, which is same as person loss and fatigue, right? Or, okay, so. Makes sense, right? So we'll go back here. And then, um, we'll go back to the slides. Okay, thank you. Um, Size, shape, volume, fraction. Okay. And same thing, we can also plot on that one, maybe on the y axis, on the other y axis, micro texture regions. We probably can f look at the literature and see how it, how it compares to the loss in life. And then this guy, Sina, uh, he works at the Air Force Research Labs also. And Adam, uh, what is Vikas? Vikas Sina and Adam Pilchak. Uh, they also showed that the size and shape of the faceted regions of the dwell fracture surfaces coincided with size and shape of measured uh, micro textured regions for titanium 6242 and 811. So I will show that in a second. What that means is essentially that, uh, that the, mm -hmm. so we'll see on the, because, okay, so this is uh, the thing, right? So there is a generality, again, another generalization. Okay, we can put a generalization here. And the general, general, generalization is near alpha or more alpha, near alpha, more alpha means more planar slip in terms of deformation. In terms of fracture, that would mean Okay, oops, okay. 
In terms of fracture, so this is deformation. And in terms of fracture, that means it is more crystallographic fracture. which is same as, this is same as faceted fracture, which is also same as slip band fracture, slip band decohesion, all that, you know, all those different, different terminology. So, So near alpha, okay, or more volume percent of alpha means more crystallographic texture, okay, more crystallographic texture, more planar slip, okay, and more, uh, okay, so le let me also make another one up here, uh, more crystallographic texture, This is all the observations over the last so many years. If you put together all these observations, this will be the final conclusion. More crystallographic implies more heterogeneous slip. Which is same as more planar slip. Okay? So, I just put page one Tuesday, that's all. Um, as opposed to, or in contrast to, less crystallographic texture, more homogeneous slip or less heterogeneous, less heterogeneous or more homogeneous. Heterogeneous slip or more homogeneous slip. Less planar slip. Same as, same as more cross slip, and the fracture would be less slip band eco, less crystallographic fracture. So this is this is like a yeah. I'm glad I put that wrote that thing down. I think that's important at the end of the, now that we're coming to a closure, I think these are some, some of the important points that you want to take with you home. So they all go together. Huh? Oh, sorry. So what we're saying is in the near alpha titanium alloys, which have got more volume fraction of alpha, you will have, it goes along with more crystallographic texture, more planar slip, and more crystallographic cracking, okay? All that stuff. Okay, let me get out of this for a second. Right. Okay. So, uh, okay, let's go here. Okay, let's, I think this is the right slide here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we know that the alpha is hexagonal closed pack structure, right? Alpha titanium is hexagonal closed pack structure. So it's got this basal plane, um, it's got this basal plane, okay? And then it's got this, yeah, the basal plane is zero, 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 one, three zeros and one. That is your, that's your base, basal plane, the, hex, the hexagon, okay? 
and then yeah, a1 a2 a3 and this is like a example of a direction 1 1 2 0 and this direction is also 0 0 0 1 direction okay which is fine uh, yeah that's okay that's also the plane and this is the direction 1 bar 1 0 0 and this is the direction 1 1 bar 2 0 so So the plastic anisotropy, essentially in alpha, beta, or alpha aluminum, alpha titanium alloys, comes because of this phase, okay? Because if it's only FCC phase or BCC phase, it's very simple. FCC phase, we only have one slip plane, one, 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 the dominant slip plane. We have other slip planes too, but one, one bar, or one bar, one, you know, one, one, one type of family, family of slip planes, you know, or for uh, FCC. And for BCC, but for BCC, I keep biting my tongue. For BCC, it's 110, okay? That's the, that's that. So the plastic anisotropy in near alpha titanium alloys comes because of this HCP crystal structure. More alpha volume fraction, more of this HCP volume fraction will be playing a role in the overall deformation, right? And the titanium alpha phase has three known slip planes, basal, prismatic, and pyramidal slip, which I'm gonna show in the next picture. Okay, so there is your basal plane. There is your basal plane. Like I said, it's three zeros one. That's a basal plane. Okay, and there is your one one. Okay, there's your prism plane. This one is your prism plane. Okay, one zero bar one zero. Um, if you want to know how to index the prism planes, I do have a, a set of notes in, the, in my thing. So I, we can print it out later, okay? So let's make a note of it. How to designate these planes may be useful for some people. So I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna use this, I'm just gonna put this um, as a note. Give out the indexing of Or maybe we can go, go over it, maybe in the afternoon or something. Give out the indexing of the planes in HCP. This is simple, not too hard. HCP crystal structure, okay? Okay. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, right, so there is your basal plane with the slip direction, one, one, bar two, zero. That's the direction. Because every slip system has to have a plane and a direction. And the other one is the prism plane, one, zero, bar, one, zero, and this slip direction. So these two guys have the same common slip direction, okay? And the pyramidal plane is take any one of these directions in the basal plane, okay, and join it to these opposite corners. That's your pyramidal plane, okay? So there is your one, one, bar two, two. And there is your, there is your one, zero, bar one, one pyramidal plane. And this one, these two joining to those two is your other pyramidal one, one, bar two, two. And you can have again joining from here to there. And then, yeah, okay? And there is your direction, one, one, bar, two, zero, which is in the slip plane. The slip direction has to be in the slip plane, right? So there is your pyramidal slip plane. There is your another pyramidal slip plane with a common direction, one, one, bar, two, zero. So they both have to be, uh, slip plane and the slip direction have to be involved. Okay? Yeah, I just wrote that same thing there. Okay, <clears throat> so these are important for the understanding the deformation of uh, hexagonal closed packed systems, whether it's zirconium or uh, magnesium, titanium. They're all HCP structures, right? And the hard orientation is the pyramidal slip. I'll show you a figure of the crystallographic results, shear stress, that's his favorite stuff. I'm gonna have a graph on that, 
hard orientation, C, the pyramidal slip, C plus A, it's called as, okay? Slip must occur for plastic deformation. And these are the soft orientations. The basal and the prism slip planes are the soft orientations. This easy slip act activation. Okay, so that's good. Now, I said the other day, the creep occurs at room temperature in titanium. It does occur in room temperature, but the only thing is, you only see the primary creep, not the secondary and the tertiary. Only primary, small portion of the primary takes place at uh, room temperature. Okay, even for stresses below, okay, obviously, significant strain can accumulate during creep as a function of time at room temperature. Okay, so Neeraj, Mike Dane, Glenn Dane, and Mike Mills, these are the three guys from University of Ohio, Ohio State University. And I, I believe it's this guy's PhD thesis because these guys are professors, Glenn and Mike, I know them pretty well. So, unusual, okay, so this is the data. First, let's look at the data. Stress is about 80% of the yield stress, okay? It's below the yield stress, 80%. I'm sorry, there. Uh, ah. Okay. So there is your 80% uh, uh, of the yield. I feel funny standing here. I can't see the view graph. Okay. Um, titanium, titanium 6211, you know, colony. Okay. 64, 6211 basket weave. So these are alpha beta processed, these two alloys, right? I mean, this alloy and that alloy, the colony and the basket weave, and then five, titanium five, two and a half. Okay. Look, look at these strains. Um, so this is what? One, two, three. Okay, 4.2, 4.2%. No, no. Point, 0.04%. That's the creep strain you're getting in the most bottom one, which is the titanium 5, which is the titanium 6.4. So it's not a whole lot, but it is there, 0.04% uh, percent creep strain. And, you know, if you have the good uh, extensometer, um, capacitance gauge, that's what they use most of the time to get those kind of strains. And they can put the capacitance gauge outside the furnace. You don't have to put it inside the furnace. You can put it outside the furnace, and it's very, accurate, very, very sensitive. Okay. <clears throat> and after 1,000 hours, it just goes over to just about 0 0.21, 0 0.22, 0 0.21, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. Uh, no, what am I talking about? Sorry. 0 0.003, 0 0.003 per, a creep, creep strain. Point, oh, point 0.2 is the slope. That point 0.2 is the slope. Okay, I was mistaken for that. So it goes from there to there, the, the creep strain. And the other data that you see there, is they're all like below point 0.02. Oh, yeah. So the maximum you get is point 0.02, and the minimum you get is that point three zeros. Four. So you see some creep strain, and this is by several different authors, okay? Several different authors. And the slope, actually, if you take this equation, that is Andrade's A and D R A D creep. How, how many know Andrade's creep? Ah, you know primary, secondary, tertiary creep? Yeah. So this is the primary creep, and this is the law of Andrade's law, right? Uh, where is it? Okay, so in the Andrade's law. Oop. Room temperature. Whole thing is at room temperature. Okay, under a creep. Okay, I hit Calibri, like aerial narrow. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so.
So there is your Andrade creep. Uh, and in that formulation of Andrade creep, alpha happens to be 0.2 here, OK? These are room temperature creep uh, studies. And then in the case of this guy, uh, Neeraj and those guys, I think the slope was a little bit different. It's a little bit different, actually. Unusual creep behavior in the titanium alloys, this is based on strain rate sensitivity. And strain rate sensitivity is defined as, uh, OK, so uh, strain rate sensitivity is defined as, let's say they use the word, uh, they use the symbol M in the literature. It is log sigma epsilon dot, a constant uh, strain and temperature, OK? That is your strain rate sensitivity parameter. Because this parameter, all it does is, it just shows to you that if you change the strain rate, how much does the stress change? So if you're doing a tensile test at room temperature, for example, you come up here, the material is yindel. Let us say you're doing it at 10 to the minus 3, the test, OK? 10 to the minus 3 per second. And you change the strain rate, let us say 10 to the minus 2. You go up one order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 2 and then let it go for a while, and then you bring it back to 10 to the minus 3. That's the test. That's the strain rate sensitivity test. From this, you can calculate how much the delta sigma goes up for every delta uh, epsilon dot. OK? And you can do that, this for several different rates, actually. And you can calculate your enthalpy for deformation. And also, you can calculate your uh, enthalpy. Enthalpy is not H. Is it H? Is it a symbol for it? Yeah. And then delta, not G. Uh, well, let's put G for now. Activation. So this is your activation enthalpy. And this is your activation energy. by doing the about tests. So you can, you can do these tests at different temperatures, different strain rates, and you can get this whole, you can write a thesis on it, actually. OK. And they did this kind of thesis back in the seven, late 70s. You, you do this on every material, one PhD thesis has been produced. You know, so. So when the materials are, so the alpha titanium materials, according to this work, uh, I'm sure that's what, you know, that's, uh, if you look at the, the thesis on strain rate sensitivity, that's what, you, that's what you will find, that the titanium alloys, near alpha titanium alloys are very strain rate sensitive, okay? Now, there is also planar deformation, like we talked about, planar slip, okay? I don't know about this short range order of titanium and aluminum atoms. I don't know why they're calling it as short range order, but that's what the literature says. So ordering is localized region. Huh? Ordering is localized region. Right, right. Yeah. But actually, it should be on the long range, actually. But OK, yeah, ordering, I think, but the ordering should exist long range. OK, but that's OK. There's no problem with that. And planar deformation leads to very low work of hardening. So actually, on that page, we can also add planar slip means low work hardening. Cross slip means more work hardening. So I remember my advisor used to get excited when we saw that one time. So there is my, I'm going to just put an elastic plastic line, planar slip. OK, pretty small slope, work hardening slope. And there is my cross slip, cross slip material. So, yeah, less work hardening. More work hardening. <clears throat> yeah? OK. 
Okay. So. Huh? We measure the strain data. We are using the capacity transducer. Huh? Capacitance transducer. Capacitance gauge. Yeah, yeah. To measure the, to measure the, yeah. But the rate, that, the rate of measurement of any quantity can be measured by only LVDT. Can be measured only by LVDT. Well, you can measure by capacitance gauge also. It just works on a different principle. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of capacitance gauge, is based on capacitance. Okay. Charge is stored in the capacitor. Charge is stored in the capacitor. What is it? I, but the rate, whenever we deal with the rate. No, no, but you're measuring the strain first and the, as a function of time, and then you're getting the rate. <coughs> The capacitance gauge is only measuring the strain. Right, not yeah, rate. not the rate. No, or only the the change in the gauge length. You divide that by original gauge length, you'll get the strain, and then you divide by the time, you get the slope. Huh? Strain because rate. Because the inductance gauges are used only in case of uh, any rate, maybe velocity, that type of rate. Of, whenever rate is involved, inductance gauges. Oh, you're thinking uh, electrical engineering. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is why. Yeah, you're not measuring, you're right. You're, you're not measuring this rate directly. You're measuring the strain and then dividing it by time, right? Only thing, what I was saying was the capacitance gauge is very, very sensitive to measure these kind of small strains. And you can also put it outside the furnace. Well, so you can, LVDT also, you can put it outside the furnace. But I remember the location of the capacitance gauge. If this is your creep frame and your sample is there, the, the the, po the, the, uh, the things that hold the, <clears throat> the, spe the specimen and all that, the bar that is there, that's where you put the gauge outside the furnace. That's what I remember, mental, my mental picture. So I'm going to show you that, uh, well, I'm going to show you means I'm going to show nearest results actually, you know, that the interaction between the slip systems is also minimized, okay? So the slip bands are able to pass. Let me show you then. It will be much easier to explain. Ah, beautiful pictures. Titanium alpha, alpha titanium gives you beautiful TEM pictures. There are two alloys that give you. If you want to be good TEM pictures, work on two alloys, either aluminum lithium alloys or near alpha titanium alloys. You are going to get such beautiful pictures, mind-blowing pictures. Look at that planar slip. You cannot believe it, how beautiful it is, right? Look at those dislocations. I'm, I, I like it, actually, personally. I love, I love these kind of pictures. So there's a slip band. You know, of course, this is a G vector. You have to orient it. This orientation, how you orient it properly. And uh, this is low angle boundary. So that means the boundary here is very low compared to the next one. There is another set of dislocations, another set of dislocation band, dislocation band. Huh? Beautiful. Planar slip. One zero, one zero. So you need this G vector to determine which slip plane it is. Okay. Say. Yeah. Okay. Planar slip in uh, prism planes observed in a creep deformed, 716 MPa, 0.9 percent strain, in a titanium six aluminum sample. So it's all alpha. Everything is alpha phase only, and beautiful slip bands. Huh? Another, uh, so that's prism plane. This is basal plane, beautiful slip bands. Huh? Very nice. Low angle grain boundary. Look at the, look at the resolution. 500 nanometers or 50? 500 nanometers. Very nice. Huh? But it's easy to get these pictures. I don't want to say, I don't want to make it look like real easy. There's a lot of, you had to sit on the microscope for quite some time. And Ohio State has got one of the best microscopes in the world, actually. I would say, it's specialized in that. The next picture is even more beautiful. Okay, so there is your planar slip, but look at this planar slip bands. There is a planar slip band coming this way, okay? And there's a planar slip band going that way. If you really look at it, there is really no obstruction for this guy because of this. You see the slip band continues. So even though this guy is there, there's not that big of an obstruction. It just plows through it, literally. And again, same thing. With this slip band, there is no 
obstruction much, they just go through. Because there is no much work hardening. Very little work hardening. If there was work hardening, first of all, you won't have these nice slip bands if it was cross slip, but you'll have a lot of dislocation forests and all that here, a lot of entanglements and all this stuff. So this fits the theory really well, actually, you know? Um, okay, I, we have done all this stuff, so I'm not going to go there. Okay, so, yeah, you know, we did all this stuff, if you remember, right? Yeah. Oh. Actually, we did. Ah, I wanted to show you this one. <clears throat> so this is one of the, this is where Jim Williams became big, actually. One of the classic works in, uh, in literature by Jim Williams and Neil Payton and those guys at Rockwell Science Center. This was the measurements performed by Jim Williams and he was the first author. Critical resolve shear stress, right? And the y-axis as a function of temperature. As a function of temperature. So essentially at room temperature, 23 degrees C, you can see that this basal and prismatic slip, in order for that to take place, it only requires about that much stress, that much stress. But when you go up here, pyramidal slip, look at how much stress you need to activate that slip, much, much higher. Okay, that's why this is the hard orientation. If you remember this slide we mentioned, where did we mention? Hard orientations, hard orientations. Oh, you cannot see my mouse there. So the pyramidal slip is being referred to as a hard orientation as compared to the basal and this, this the soft, soft orientations. Okay. <clears throat> we did all this stuff, the forging, uh, oh yeah, yeah, they're here. So the forging guys, yep. Primary alpha transformed beta, okay? This is the duplex microstructure, if everybody remember. Thermomechanical processing to obtain, you know, uh, about the beta transits, like we talked yesterday, or day before, or some other day. This is beta, below the beta transits. When you do the hot deformation work here, you're doing the, below the alpha, below the beta region. So homogenization of the ingot, Thermomechanical work either here, oh, I keep using it more. So homogenization, thermomechanical work here, which is in the alpha beta region or in the beta region, right? And you can take it for recrystallization over there and then annealing it, okay? And then cooling <coughs> will produce this microstructure there. And uh, depending on the cooling rate, of course, the thickness of this lamellae the thickness of this lamellae, alpha lamellae, will be defined by the cooling rate. So this all fits, every, everything fits very fantastically, right? And we also said this kind of a uh, microstructure is good for crack growth resistance compared to equiax alpha. Okay. And then we just talked about that. Okay, now let me just do one thing again. I'm sorry, uh, you have to, let me see the slide sorter. Okay, let me put up this one. Actually this one also. Uh, I gotta do one at a time so that, okay. So here come the dislocation uh, theories a lot. So all, a lot of dislocation theory goes in here, but I'm just putting you, giving you the just final. Uh, so you now remember the prism planes 
on the prisma on the pyramidic plane a pyramid plane so we got this soft grain so here is a soft grain and here is a hard grain okay so slip resulting so if you if you have a pile up here okay and if you want to transfer it to the next orientation or next grain for instance and if this grain is oriented you know the next grain that's oriented here is a hard grain okay that means it's hard to slip in there and uh, this slip can take place but if it doesn't if you do not have enough stress to if the stress for the decoherence of this boundary is less than the stress it takes to transfer the slip to this then the fracture would take place otherwise the slip would take place so when we do the uh, um, crystal plasticity models those are the kind of things we answer usually from the from the modeling will it will the will the uh, will the slip takes place or will the decohesion will take place what is the statistical numbers and all those stuff you know if we have time i may just kind of touch upon it a little bit okay so slip resulting from this location pile up in the soft grain is transferred to the edges and hard grain the transfer slip in the hard grain results in a planar slip band which ultimately decoheres as a fracture facet parallel to the basal plane well actually come to think of it what i said is a little bit different from what i see here so either you can have a decoherence here <clears throat> the other decoherence you can also have is a decoherence here see this see this uh, this resolution here i mean the the resolve she i mean the resolve shear stress you have a a sigma which is perpendicular to this okay this can decohere right here on this basal slip plane 0, 0, 0, 1. so that's why these days what we do to understand crystal plasticity a lot more we take these fracture surfaces to the scanning electron microscope and we look at the orientations of these fractured grains so we can relate these fractured grains to this deformation that's taking place Okay, and here is a more detailed paper by, I have this paper in here actually. I'm going to, maybe I'll take this out later on if we, uh, this is from the Royal Society, Federal uh, Royal Society, Fe, uh, yeah, Royal Society Proceedings. This is 2015, so it's quite new actually, quite new, and Dan is the group leader actually, and there is a, uh, bimodal type of a microstructure in a 6 to 4 to alloy. Okay, primary alpha and transform beta, and the hard working was done as a forging in alpha beta field. Okay, and that's the microstructure that results. And here are three photographs. I think I lifted this. Okay, there is your regular fatigue, okay, constant amplitude fatigue, there is your dwell fatigue. And there is your static load. Try to see if you can see any differences between the. No. God, I get thirsty every day. Mm. Oops, sorry. Let me see if I, I, I wanted to do this. So there is your normal fatigue. What do you see there? Okay, that's your normal fatigue. Even in normal fatigue, let me come over here. In the small, when it was small, you couldn't see this. Even in normal fatigue, you see these regions? Huh? Completely different, right? These are those alpha regions. Even in normal fatigue, you're seeing this. Okay, let me turn that down, go back. Okay. Let's go here. There is your dwell fatigue. You have to put this side by side, I think, little to get a little better picture of it. But you can clearly see the difference. I can see that because I'm more used to it. But you can see this, the planar the planar slip band cracking. See this whole thing? That's a planar slip band cracking. 
this whole thing is a planar slip band. Well, these are little pieces here. There is another, you know. This almost looks like a cleavage in a way, or transgranular fracture, but this is what, that's why, you know, it's like going to the doctor and saying, well, I'm not good, feeling good. He has to check everything. But if you say, well, I have a headache or I have a toothache, then you can focus there, right? So the same way when you're going here, you, you have to know what material you're working with, what are the tests that you have done, and what is that you're looking for. But if you took a fracture piece to the SEM without knowing what you're doing, you can be there trying to find needle in a haystack, basically. So it's always important to know your, your uh, parameters, what is that the, the test was done under, right? So there is your, uh, uh, instead of doing that, let me just go back. Okay, so let's take the static load, just dead load. Huh? The dead load looks like dwell fatigue load. So this is like a dead load. So it's not fatigue, right? It's not dwell fatigue, it's just dead load. That means K-max. So, ah, so this is what it is. Let me put this up. So number one we saw was, let us use the same waveform, triangular waveform. Number two we saw, oops, okay. On number three we saw, I'm gonna put this for a second, this is the dead load, but this gone. This is gone. That's my dead load. Okay? So this is my P max, my P min, P max, oh, P max. P min, or if you want to have a mean stress, there is a mean stress, okay? So you can have this as your P max, dead load. You can keep it here, or you can keep it there, your dead load test. If you keep it here, you'll get better results because the load is higher, right? Better results means easier to see what's going on. So if you really want to do a test here, and then you can do a test there and see the differences also. So you can see here the fracture surface was different, right? Here you had this and this combined. This, this and this combined was this, right? The fatigue form and, and this dead load was this. This is the fatigue, dead load. Fatigue, dead load. Fatigue, dead load. So the dead load was 60 seconds. Fatigue, I don't know how much it was. 60 seconds. Here, continuously. So that's what you're getting. It's a constant amplitude loading. Yeah. Constant amplitude loading? Yeah. Beach marks. Beach marks. You won't see beach marks at this level, at the scanning electron microscope. Beach marks are usually much lower magnification, maybe 50x. So you won't see beach marks here. You'll see more striations. Good point. You won't see striations that much when you're having planar slip. For some reason, we don't see it. Even though the crack is propagating by fatigue mode, when you have a lot of planar slip, you're only seeing those slip, the, you know, the, you won't see the striations that much. But if you have a lot of cross slip, then you see much more striations that are much easily visible. I mean, you'll see it, but you have to, you know, play with it a little bit more. But not a whole lot. I have never, I had always have a hard time looking at slip striations, you know. Now I don't go to the SEM, but when I used to, yeah, I used to see more striations. This is a when it varies, effect of meat stress, hmm. Hmm. So you, you, you can see right there. So that is your main stress, right? So this is your main stress. If you bring the main stress down here, it will be different from you taking the mean stress up here. So you can take this to more positive loads or you can take it to more negative loads. You can shift the whole thing down, right, along with this. So you can have less positive load 
or more positive load, that will affect the. In terms of the resistance, static resistance, as yeah. it increases. It, as the mean becomes more and more positive or increases in that sense, it will be more static, more a dead load test. <clears throat> Yeah, 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 yeah. The fatigue part will, yes, yeah. In this case, yes, yeah. Yeah, physically, yes, that's what is happening. <clears throat> okay, let me just put this up again here. So this is from that paper, from the Royal Society paper, which is actually uh, so they call it they call it the rogue grain combination. There is a loading direction: soft grain, hard grain, uh, soft grain again. So it's all about uh, transfer of slip and fracture where it's taking place in those grains, essentially. Okay. My, my thinking is that any time you have a hard time transferring slip, you're going to get a fracture. Yeah. And the rogue grains here, the, the rogue grains here, how the rogue, rogue grains are you know, oriented also uh, will decide the fracture modes. And there is more analysis of this, which I can show actually. Uh, is there any method to calculate this transition grain grain? Hmm? Transition zone. That is because it's after how to calculate the stress at that point? Is there any I mean, there are no simple formulas. I mean, um, I mean the stress required to cross the slip, uh, cross the boundary. Yeah. Well, you saw here, for instance, uh, Williams. Uh, these are experimental met these are experimental results, and also this. Uh, see the dotted. Uh, one of the two lines is a prediction. There's a dotted line and there's a solid solid line. The data points are definitely experiments, and usually we show the model results, you know, uh, with a dotted line usually. So the solid line is experimental, experimental, and this dotted line is a model which perfectly matches the experiments. You know, and uh, this is a little bit more involved, actually. Yeah. I think it's not. Uh, OK, hold your thought just for a second. Um, let me do one thing. OK. Hold your thought. Don't forget it. I'll see if I can pull it up. So here is a titanium 6.4 sample. It's a low magnification. I mean, just showing the SCM, you know, showing the faceted fracture in the dual fatigue. You know, that's what we're talking about. It looks like very much like, uh, you know, all these, all these facets. They all look like plain, you know, like intergranular or not intergranular, but transgranular cleavage type of fractures. But actually, they're slip band fractures. But you have to know that you're working with a planar slip band material. If you don't know that, then you, you cannot tell what these are. You can say that, well, I look, I see some features which look like slip bands. They could be, well, they definitely are not cleavage, but they look like cleavage, but they're not. They're no river lines. Yeah. So you have to know the whole thing. Yeah. OK. Um, let's go through this, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more. After a break, we'll, we'll go through this first. Um, alloy composition, we already said that those containing a high volume fraction of the HCP phase, um, is, they're susceptible to uh, you know, dwell fatigue, okay? And low volume fractions of beta BCC phase. And the most susceptible alloys contain clusters of alpha grains that have small misorientations with them, the micro textured regions.
I wish I had a picture of that. Maybe I have. Let me see. Okay. See, the thing is this, that in some cases, when you're doing tests like this, you got to keep this in mind. Sometimes when you're doing a test like this with a dwell, with a dwell time, you don't, you're not necessarily doing dwell fatigue. You're probably doing creep fatigue test. You may be doing it because at this time you're doing creep and this is fatigue. Okay? You could be doing that. So, or you could be doing a creep oxidation uh, fatigue test. You may not be necessarily be doing dwell fatigue tests. So you have to be, you know, again, these are little complications in the whole business. So if this is a nickel-based superalloy and you're doing this test at a high temperature where there's a possibility for oxidation, there's a possibility for a creep also, but not necessarily dwell fatigue in this sense dwell fatigue then you may be doing a creep fatigue test or a creep fatigue oxidation test. And uh, yes, go ahead. For welding. Uh, for welding. Mm. We pass in argon to prevent surface mm. oxidation. Yeah. So when we uh, subject it to fatigue, can we prevent oxidation? Because we had uh, passed argon. So you're talking welding. Yes. Then so during welding, you're pushing ergon so that you push the oxygen out yes. so you get a better weld. Yes. Yeah, okay. After you take we... that specimen which is welded or yes. now you're doing a test. On At high temperatures, yes. very high temperatures, yeah. Can we prevent oxidation because already we are passed on? No, 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 no. You can only do that uh, if you're doing in a vacuum chamber. Because what did you do after all? All you did was you took a nickel-based superalloy and you welded it. It's still a super alloy, you know. Only thing is the structure is cast structured a little bit. The welded structure is cast. You know, it's not a rock material anymore. And uh, if you're now doing a fatigue test, you know, sorry, if you're doing a fatigue test, you're exposing that to a high temperature, so oxidation will take place, and so will creep. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Okay. We can also talk about a little bit more. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that during the break. So here we're talking about dwell fatigue. Um, so. So my recommendation to you is this. When you're reading literature, please don't think that the author is completely right. Don't. Question the author and make sure that he's, you know, he or she is saying the right thing. Because sometimes we say things which may not be right. Not intentionally, but we don't know something. We're missing the data points, you know. So, so don't think that you're doing dwell fatigue. You may not be doing dwell fatigue. You know, this is, you know, specifically alpha, beta, titanium, at low temperatures, where we know for sure there will be dwell fatigue going on, dwell fatigue happening. So, okay. Okay, so look at the uh, number four. A remarkable feature about titanium alloys is the creep at room temperature, right? A phenomenon known since 1949, but not explained. Actually, it was uh, noticed by a guy, I don't remember his name, Attenstadt or somebody. I tried to look for the paper a long time ago, I could never find it. It's published in Metals Progress, Metals Progress 1947, I thought it was 49. But I couldn't find that paper. Maybe we can find it here. That's the first time anybody noticed dwell fatigue in titanium. Okay. Attenstadt, Metal Progress. Uh, so some have suggested in the literature that creep is a key aspect of cold dwell fatigue. 
because it leads to less stress redistribution and concentration, which is necessary for crack nucleation. Say a mouthful of, a lot of words there. Okay? A lot of words there. I, I don't know about this. I, you know, I would have to think about this actually more. You know, these are all called as uh, guesswork, right? Maybe guesswork is not the, uh, what do you call those kind of statements where you make statements without proof? Uh, uh, guess, uh? Hypo yeah, yeah, hypothesis or something, yeah, yeah. You don't know for sure, so you're, uh, that's why you do experiments and theory, to prove those things, right? You think that something is true, and then you do the experiment and theory, and then you say, well, that's not true, what I, what I thought. Um, okay, and then fracture morphology, you know, life of the specimen, okay? 120 degrees cel Celsius. So the question comes up is, does it have a relationship with dwell fatigue? Because when you are holding the, the fatigue cycle for that 60 seconds, at the whole time, will creep take place? Will that primary strain contribute to the overall fatigue life going down? That's the question that nobody knows, how to answer that question, right? I just showed you some micrographs that Neeraj and uh, Glendane and Mike Mills did nice planar slip bands, and why creep strain, why the material creeps at room temperature, but it does not give you an answer for dwell fatigue. We have to make that connection somehow, and we are not able to, right? That's the problem. And then, uh, somebody's asking a question, yeah. Can you say that if we put the airplane at high temperature, titanium alloy, and we bring it at lower temperature, oxygen tries to go inside the plane. Is that It all depends on how high a temperature always, right? What temperature does titanium absorb oxygen in solid state? That's the question to ask, right? Normally when we put hydrogen into titanium at a high temperature, it's quite high temperature. It's not the melting point, but it's still quite high. You know, 800 degrees C, 700 degrees C, something like that. But you're not reaching any, any, any close to the temperature. Titanium has got a very high melting point, extremely high, right? Does anybody know what the melting point of titanium is? 16, 60, about that, 1600 degrees C, Celsius. You're not taking the airplane any close to that. You're taking the airplane, maybe the compressor and the fan, maybe don't go above four, 300 degrees Celsius at the most, so. We are only using that material because it's lightweight. We don't need nickel there, which is heavier than titanium. And we don't have anything in between aluminum, magnesium, and titanium as far as metal is concerned. So that's why we are using that, right? I mean, that's what I think. I'm sure there are more answers to that, you know. So I don't think that oxygen will bother it so much. But if you go to a higher temperature, yes, you will absorb the hydrogen. I mean, and oxygen both. If you go to a higher temperature, definitely. Yeah, if you bring it to room temperature, yes. There are situations like that. I can't talk on the camera. Yep, okay. Um, okay, we looked at the, uh, we looked at some other stuff. Let me just come out of this for a second and go to this Royal Society paper that I was talking to. So there is this paper that I was talking about, the very first paper uh, I just sent it to Amit, he'll make a copy of that to other people. Add instead, 1949, creep of titanium at room temperature. It was published in Metal Progress, and it's a two-page paper, 658 to 660, two-page paper. And Amit said he'll be happy to copy, get that paper and put it in the, report, in the final, final thing. That's a, you know, interesting paper to read, huh? Okay. There is another nice paper right after that, 2003, Bach. Review, re review paper, dwell sensitive fatigue in titanium alloys. Role of microstructure, texture, and operating conditions. Okay, I can also print this out. There is uh, David McDowell and this guy. Okay, computation modeling of fatigue, crack formation. You know, there are so many others. You know, Vikas Sinha that I was talking about. 
Mike Mills, Jim Williams. Okay. So there are several of them. So, yeah. You have said that earlier we talked about the ASTM 399. We have talked a lot about ASTM E399. E399, yeah, fracture toughness. So some, something has to be standardized system for measuring the, for this or this also exists or not. It depends on what the community thinks. You know, I mean, what is the community that is working in this area? I'm, I don't work in this area that much, okay. except giving maybe, you know, talking when people are talking about it. ASTM, ASTM, ASTM is working on dwell fitting. Okay, there you go. So they're developing a standard for dwell fitting. Okay, All right. do, they have, do they have a draft standard? Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean they've made it. I think it's 2617. 2617. Okay, wow. That's good to hear that. Oh, you're talking about uh, creep fitting interactions. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was a part of that. I was a part of that. That's not 2617. But he's asking about creep dwell fit, this dwell fitting. Dwell fitting. Now, <clears throat> okay, that's what I was saying before. We have to distinguish between dwell fitting and creep fitting interactions. Okay? Creep fitting interactions are a little bit different from dwell fitting. Dwell fitting is a word that's being used by the, in, by the engine community mainly for titanium alloys for this kind of a problem, specifically for this problem. But the creep fitting interaction that you are talking about is for any other alloys, nickel-based super alloys, titanium aluminides. Actually, for the, the Cameron Nigbin is coming, right? Cameron and I and Ashok was the one who driven, Ashok Saxena, they're all coming to the two-year meeting. We started that, and I was the chairperson for that. Ashok made me a chairperson, that's why I was there, for the developing that standard for creep brittle materials. I thought I showed you that paper. Let me, let me go there, hold on one second. Um, yeah, just, I just want to, you know, there are all these terms you have to be, you know, there, there's sometimes, sometimes they overlap. Uh, Creep, crack growth. So this is the one we have, uh, E1457. No, standard test method for creep fitting interactions. Right? This is the one? Creep fitting crack growth testing. Uh, let me do the creep, creep crack growth testing. This is the one. Creep crack growth testing. Okay, this is another one. So in this one, there is, uh, let me show you. Uh, Google Scholar. Okay, here we go. Creep. Brittle So this is Cameron. I'm talking about Cameron Nigman. So this is the one we did crack growth in the presence of limited creep deformation. This is the data that we put for the creep crack growth standard. This one. E1457. So this is a little bit different. Uh, this is a little bit different than the dwell fatigue we're talking about. This is titanium 6242, I think. Yeah. 2519 aluminum alloy and titanium alloy 6242. 360, 135 and 500 degrees C, up to 500 degrees Celsius, the testing. So this is a little bit different again. 
So there are so many different, different things. So when we are talking about dwell fatigue, we are, we are only talking about uh, this particular problem, uh, Jalaj. We're talking about this particular problem that especially in titanium, near alpha titanium alloys, which we are not able to solve, but it's a very serious problem for the engine community. So because it's a problem and we don't know how to solve it, what we are doing is to do more inspections than necessary, just to make sure that nothing is wrong with the, with the disc, the fan disc. And then we're also concerned about the uh, over design. Till we know exactly what is going on, we don't, um, we don't know what to do. Up until then, we have to go with over design and also more periodic inspections. So if we pull all the data together so far that we, we know in this area, if we put a little bit of, actually this may be a good time to do it. So far we have seen that to solve this problem, what we are finding is titanium creeps at room temperature. That data point we have. We know that near alpha titanium alloys have these micro textured regions. Let me see if I can pull out. This is, I think, this is Adam Pilchek's paper. And then the Royal Society paper is talking about the rogue grains. This is the Okay. <clears throat> and then we're talking about debit in fatigue life. Of course, this is in the front due to whole time. <coughs> right? And this happens in fatigue crack growth test, also in low cycle fatigue. This is Tarun Majumdar, I think, or Goswami. I think, I don't know who is. So that's what we have right now, okay? And, uh, right, I mean, I don't know if we, uh, again, if we have to have a test standard, it has to come from people like DMRL or AFRL, you know, Air Force Research Labs guys. Those are the guys who have to propose saying that, hey, this is a real issue. Let us develop a, <coughs> a test standard. We did that, huh? Not in terms of test standards, but we tried to form it using some other techniques. Right, it's right. Like yeah, yeah. So I think that's, uh, that is the data points we have so far. You know what I mean? Uh, let's... Uh, Okay, I'm gonna close this, not important. So this is the Williams paper uh, um, that I talked before, it's here. Um, so this is all the data that we have. Again, beautiful micrographs titanium, near alpha titanium. Critical results, shear stress is a function of temperature. And there is the critical result shear stress, compression tension. Okay, so anyways, uh, let me go here. But let me pull up the, on this one. <clears throat> okay, this is the, this will be there in the, in the report, but this is only for mostly people who are very much interested in the fundamentals of dislocations. <clears throat> Hmm. <clears throat> 
Again, very fundamental things. I don't think I'm reading it. Does anybody is reading this one? Okay. So. Okay. Here is a crystal plasticity models have been applied to cold well fatigue. I can show you that. Why does the addition of molly suppress cold well fatigue? So there have been experiments to show that, okay? And there are some explanations here, possible explanations. Uh, let me put up here. Possible explanations are that molly forms comp complexes with vacancies, you know, and all the stuff. Why does raising the temperature to only 200 degrees uh, suppress cold well fatigue? So there are all these questions, but we don't have the answers. Okay, it's so more questions than answers. Uh, so here are some uh, experiments again done on 6242 silicon with the three point, three point bend samples. Let me put this up. There, in titanium 6242, no dwell fatigue was observed at room temperature, right? Yeah. And for whole times of 60 seconds. No time dependence and only fatigue dominated, you know, crack growth. But when you go to, uh, who was asking me about difference between cyclic and dwell, right? So here's a graph that shows the, on the left side you have the graph for Pure fatigue, the dotted line is for pure fatigue, and the solid curve is for the dwell fatigue. You can see the differences in the number of cycles to failure, right? And this is, uh, this one is two minutes, two seconds, two seconds. So two seconds going up, two minutes dwell, and two seconds coming down. And this is bimodal forging. There's so many variables, too many variables. Maybe design of experiments has to be done. I don't think anybody has done on this before. How are you going to uh, resolve this issue? I have no idea. If anybody's got some ideas, you know, you can, but because see, this is a good, good difference there, good difference in the, big difference in the uh, dwell and the cyclic fatigue. Unbelievable difference. 2,000 cycles, it fails here. Here it goes up to almost 10,000. Sample taken from the central portion of the forging. Okay. And again, dwell fatigue led to, led to more cleaved alpha grains. Now I want to be, you to be careful that cleaved alpha grains are the same as the slip band, same as slip band cracking. Remember, we put up on the sheet, um, all that stuff, that, all those things. <clears throat> this is the titanium 1100. The reason we call it as 1100 is because it goes to 1100 degrees F. That's why we call it as titanium 1100, okay? And the composition is right there. Six aluminum, 2.7 tin, four zirconium, 0.4 moly, 0.45 silicon, okay? Lemular microstructure. Can somebody tell me as to why this lemular structure is so different looking than normal lemular microstructure? One of the issues, you know that, You have an answer? I mean, I'm just wondering. It looks a little bit different, right? Yeah, but it is a lemular structure in 1100. Solution heated at 1868 for 30 minutes air cooled. There is a prior beta gain size and there is the lamellar you know, spacing. Okay? Let me know if you know the answer. It kind of looks to me like it's not fully developed lamellar microstructure for some reason. It's not fully developed. Huh? 
It's not fully developed. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. But I, I don't know why because the the heat treatment is all done properly, huh? Okay. 20, 20x, okay. 20, okay. That thing, it, it looks like that. Okay. This kind of structure we have observed. Okay. So if you go to low magnifications, you will see that. Uh, I the, the, okay. Okay. So I got all these things in for you. Uh, there is a, a yeah, Goswami, not Majumdar, or not. Uh, Majumdar, yeah, Goswami. So he did some low cycle fitting, these kind of uh, dull fitting, right? So basically, you're, you're holding it here. Instead of holding it at constant load, this is a constant load, constant stress, constant K test. Here, it's a low cycle fitting test, and you're holding it at a constant strain. And the load. You're holding it at a constant strain. So people are just trying different, different experiments to see if they can get to the answer. But to me, it looks like a, you know, just, just a test without, you know, I, I don't know the reasoning. Why would one, I mean, why this test would reveal anything more other than just giving you some answers, some, some, some things a new dual sensitivity damage parameter. So a lot of materials tested, copper alloys, super alloys, iron 100, it's a powder metallurgy titanium, Rene 95, wasp alloy, and then also uh, there is a NAR alloy Z. That's a, oh, I'm using my mouse here. That's a space uh, material, NAR alloy Z. Okay. This will be there. Okay, more of this. Okay, so let me go to, uh, that's all what I have on this thing. But let me pull up a couple of papers here, just to, I haven't made slides, uh, but I saw some papers when I was talking to her. To Baramati here, one of them is, right, this one. Uh, there is the crystal plasticity model, okay? Um, I wanted to show you this. I wanted to show you this. This equation here. You remember we were talking about the strain rate sensitivity parameter? So here is the Something like that, gamma dot alpha, which gives you the slip rate, essentially. So this is your mobile dislocation density. This is the frequency at which the dislocations are trying to jump the barrier. Burgers vector, activation energy, right? Delta H, activation energy for self-diffusion, okay? Boltzmann's constant, this is less some temperature, shear stress, Corresponding critical results here stress, tau sub C alpha. Huh? Where do you find it? I'm sorry, activation energy for self diffusion in creep. Where it will be coming from. So when you are doing your creep, uh, let me draw this, maybe it'll be easier. Um, <clears throat> so, so same thing, like he put, he put gamma dot, okay? You can put gamma dot instead of epsilon dot, which is fine. Both are strain. Strain rate, some constant, exponential, minus delta G, that's what he used there, divided by KT, and some sigma here, sigma raised to n. So that is your creep strain rate. That's your strain rate. So let us say creep strain rate. 
Or if you want, it could be plastic strain it also, no problem. Don't let it scare you, same thing. This process, so this is a process, right? Because the strain rate is changing. The strain is changing as a function of time. So there is a process by which it happens. So the process can take, can be controlled by, let me put this on a piece of paper, on our paper. This looks like it's important. If I write it on the board, we lose it. Let me put it on the paper. It is your thing. So epsilon dot, well, or gamma dot is equal to some constant, the stress on the specimen, exponential, delta G over KT. This is your Boltzmann's constant, okay, K sub BT. This process is a creep process or some kind of a plastic deformation process. Is or can be controlled by dislocations. Remember, this is a symbol we have been using for dislocations or vacancies. If the temperature is low, again, low and higher relatively comparison to each other. This is at relatively low temperature. This is a process at relatively high temperature, okay, where vacancies can move, okay? Here, at this point, at high temperatures, uh, it could be a self-diffusion, let me put here, vacancies, vacancy, vacancy movement. This could be by self-diffusion. That means, this is a titanium alloy, right? Titanium aluminum? Let's say titanium. Or it could be a uh, self lattice diffusion. Or this could be a grain boundary diffusion. Right? So, oh shit. Okay. Grain boundary diffusion. Yeah, so we have a process, like that, uh, that gamma dot, I'll put it back again. So remember this equation. You have a load activation energy. This process can be controlled by either by dislocations or vacancies. Let us say this happens at low temperatures. We won't consider that for right now. Let's consider this. Happens at high temperatures. This vacancy movement can be inside the lattice. So there is your lattice. There is my lattice, right? So it could be moving inside, you know, inside. Okay, and it's going, you know, by struggling and somehow going to the next, you know, moving along like this. Or it could be grain boundary. So this one I'm talking about is this one, self-diffusion. This is grain boundary diffusion, okay? So all these guys, Navarro, Heron. So this is cobalt creep. This is Navarro, Heron. 
I don't know, is it the other way? I don't know. One is one, the other one is other. So the activation energy that you need for this one is higher than the activation energy for grain boundary. Self diffusion. Which one will take place? Which one? This one will take place. This one will take place. This one will take place. That one will take place. It all depends on this temperature and this stress. That will determine which of these will take place. You can always argue. Actually, I'm thinking in my head after you asked the question, why is he talking about diffusion? He probably should be talking about dislocations, maybe. I don't know. Maybe he should be talking about dislocations and not vacancies, not self-diffusion, because in titanium, we're only talking about 120 degrees C. That's all di dislocation creep. So. Concentration gradient, yeah, you, what you're saying is true. It could be due to concentration gradient. Uh, yeah, purely concentration gradient, yes, it's gonna happen. If you have too many atoms here, too less here, they'll start flowing up on, yeah, to, from the hill, yes. Yeah, you're asking tough questions. Fundamental philosophical, I mean, fundamental questions, which is interesting. Yeah. You're right. Diffusion is taking place because of a gradient in concentration. This diffusion is contributing to strain. I'm going to make something up. <laughs> Somebody, you're asking questions. I'm going to give, make up an answer for you. I'm going to write this equation as d epsilon dt is equal to a sigma raised to n exponential minus delta g over kt, right? So my epsilon, d epsilon, some time t1 or epsilon one to epsilon two, that is my increment in the creep deformation is a function of, I have a constant stress. This whole thing is constant. This whole thing is a constant. Constant temperature test, constant stress test. My process is same. Everything is a constant. I want to put it a constant, dt. So A prime t. is equal to epsilon. Oh. Well, I may have to put here sigma, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to make something up. You said. Uh, you said uh, concentration gradient, true. Um, I'm just going to put, if I have a little volume element here, this epsilon, this d epsilon that will take place, this volume element, uh, d epsilon, will be taking place because of a stress gradient, sigma 2, sigma 1. Inside, inside the, inside a small zone inside the component. So you can, but the, but the point is this, and that is taking place due to your, uh, yeah. so instead of concentration gradient here, the vacancies are being driven by a stress, assi stress assisted diffusion, right? Remember the fixed law, law number one and law number two. The law number one is what you just said, diffusion, diffusion code, yeah. And the second one could be a stress-assisted diffusion. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Or Kumar Jata's second law. No, it's fixed. Okay. So basically, this is your. Oh. Um,
So that slip rate, let me just take out all this mess that I just made. So that slip rate is your creep. Okay, that is, that is your creep, essentially. That is D epsilon DT. You got mobile dislocations in a row M, B, V bar. Yeah. Yeah. You remember the equation? There is an equation that is the mobile dislocation density equation. Rho MBV epsilon dot is equal to Huh? Yeah. You talk about strain? Oh yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Then yeah, I mean a critical, and then I just uh, yeah, yeah. Difference between that? Well, one is a critical, one is not critical. <laughs> right? It says critical. <laughs> no, I mean you see what I'm saying, right? I mean, in order for a shear strain to happen, you have to have it difference in shear strength. That's what I try to do here, sigma one, sigma two, to produce the d epsilon, right? So here to produce the d gamma, you have a d tau. D, d, tau. d tau, right? The d tau is equal to tau minus tau critical, right? So don't make this mathematics too harder, as hard as Ramanujan's mathematics. It's not anything close to it. It's the same way, sigma will send the sigma. Yeah, yeah, sigma is equal, tau is equal to sigma divided by 2. Yeah, yeah. Right? Tau is equal to sigma. Yes, yeah. Creep, creep region, yeah. Or plastic region. Or visco, yeah. I mean, a gradient in, yeah, a strain d epsilon has to take place because of, either because of the gradient in the, you know, in the atoms or vacancies, something like he was talking about. There has to be a driving force, right? Either a concentration gradient has to drive the diffusion, or in this case, a stress diffusion, a stress-assisted diffusion, right? See the gamma dot that you're obtaining here the slip rate, that could be a plastic slip rate if you're talking about plastic, or if you're talking about creep, it's a creep slip, you know, deformation rate, but that has to take place because of the, some kind of a tau, de de delta tau. Yeah, yeah. And this is nothing but, this part, rho sub m b v is nothing but Epsilon dot, or you can put as gamma dot. If you put it gamma, you'll put what, uh, twice or something, or epsilon is equal to two gamma, right? Yeah. And I don't know where the hyperbolic comes from. Okay. So that is basically your crystal plasticity model, essentially. Beginning of the crystal plasticity model. <laughs> Okay, that's one equation I wanted to show you, 2.1. These, the, these are all the eff efforts that are being put into understanding dual fitting. <laughs> you can make it more complicated than what it is. <laughs> yeah. You're trying to make it more complicated? Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Slater? Slater. Slater. Oh, okay. You're following Slater's book? Good for you. That's, I don't think I will understand the book, so I'll leave it to you. <laughs> no, okay, yeah. So, you know, uh, 
So here you got that, see, there is your critical is equal to some nominal number. Can you see this one? You, you're seeing it on the computer, okay. So there is that same equation that I wrote there, epsilon dot is equal to G M B, epsilon dot is equal to rho M B V. That's, that's the same equation as this. That's the same as this. Okay? Only thing is that dislocation density has now been broken up into uh, statistically stored dislocations and geometrically necessary dislocations. So now you have to go up and look up what those two things are. <laughs> if you don't remember, then you have to start looking at those two. What can you do, right? But that's your crystal plasticity, beginning of those things, right? I just wanted to show you this, you know. Then you go into matrices here, make it more complex, matrices, you know, transpose and regular matrix. Um, okay, this, we don't need that much. All the parameters are here. All the parameters are there. Mobile dislocation density, initial dislocation density, frequency at which the dislocations are jumping each time, you know. Burgers vector, Boltzmann's constant, of course. Strain rate, starting strain rate, some initial strain rate, some, you know. Ah, critical result shear stress of the basal, for the basal plane. Activation, comma prism. Yeah, either one of those. Not pyramid. I was worried that it was pyramid. It's not. Okay. So you got all these numbers there to, to crunch and grind that equation, <laughs> you know. So you had to look and see why these guys are doing all this for dwell fatigue. That's the thing. Because the thing is dwelling, I mean, the, th not dwelling. the thing is uh, deforming, right? Uh, because during dwell fatigue, we are getting some creep is happening, which can happen in room temperature at low, low degrees. So that, that strain that is coming along is because of that equation there. Okay? So he's just making it a little bit more, he's from University of Cambridge, so he's making it a little bit more complicated. No, not because of that, I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. But it's more realistic also. So, and then, okay, those are all modulus and G. So he went up to 300 degrees Celsius, change up to 300 degrees Celsius. I'm actually reading this paper as you live right now, okay? I'm just reading it as I'm going along with you. So, and here is our Williams work, the classic work. This is a great piece of work, very, very important, right? The pyramidal slip has got a higher critical dissolved shear stress compared to the basal and prism. Oh, okay. It's actually an interesting paper, it looks like. A little bit of fine element analysis. There's a hard grain, there's a soft grain. So now your question of, uh, who was asking that question during the break, how are you going to uh, transfer the slip, you know, from the soft to the hard and the hard to the soft, this probably will answer some of those questions. So if you do the, huh? Hard grain from the, how do you differentiate? So we defined, right? So for example, the basal plane and the prism plane require much smaller, let me get to the figure. To get these guys activated, you need a much smaller stress. But to get to this guy activated, look at how much the big difference is. So this is the harder, harder mode, softer mode. So that's the complexity of uh, gamma. I mean, uh, HCP microstructure. A little bit more difficult than the normal FCC, BCC micro, I mean, crystal structures. Because you've got this pyramidal plane, basal plane, and prism plane for slip. It makes it more complicated.
So all I want to do is to basically leave you with the idea that the dwell fatigue is still uh, not completely understood, like we like we're saying. There are a whole bunch of data points. How do you pull this data together and try to make an understanding? I don't know. I mean, you know, I think it will require some effort for somebody to understand this. If you have a whole summer available to you, free to nothing to do, <laughs> I mean, it's a good time to take a you know a problem like this and do it and work with somebody who knows what they're doing, right? So. Yeah, it's a lot of, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so there were some questions before. During the uh, break, somebody was asking, do you still have those questions? Who, was, who has those questions? No, everybody's quiet. Now, during the break, five people show up and, uh, uh, so make a list of your questions. Uh, maybe tomorrow's Tuesday. No, today's Tuesday. We have Wednesday and Thursday, two days still left. So if you bring your questions, make a list of the questions actually. It'll be more, much more, you know, instead of just shooting off questions as they come to your mind, instead of that, just kind of make a list and bring those questions, then we will try to discuss them. I may not be able to answer everything, but we'll answer them, yeah. Sir, you want to discuss about the real case studies if you have some. Oh, yeah, yeah. Real Oh, uh, yeah, any all the theory and all that, yeah. Any real yeah, let me do one thing, because we're asking live, so let me see if I, uh, let me see if I have something here, okay. Um, in my, save. Okay. Um, spring. Let me see. I think I had it here some. Uh, four. <clears throat> okay. BC10. Ah. Well, this is. This volume 11, ASM Metals Handbook, Failure Analysis and Prevention. Write that down. And if you can get it, try to get it. And uh, let me see if I can pick something here. Then we can, let me say, find. Uh, creep failure. Okay, creep failure, uh, let's put this one, super alloy, nope, okay. Huh? Yeah. No, there are a couple of guys who wrote very good books, actually. Okay, so I just put randomly, I put 
uh, creep, I think, and I put super alloy or something, and this is what showed up in my, in my search, okay? And uh, let me see, is that what I put in find? Uh, I don't know what I put in, okay. But this is what it showed up. So here is an example of a thermomechanical fatigue cracking and oxidation in a first stage turbine blade. Okay, so you can look at the, let us see if there are any uh, given conditions here, for instance. Okay, here, that was what, figure number four, right? Okay, figure four, figure four, figure four. Figure three, okay. So there is my figure four. There, thermal fatigue. So you can read about, read about thermal fatigue right there. It's a real problem. So thermal strains are generated in airfoils because outer surfaces change temperature more rapidly than the metal within. In turbine foils, creep strains are superimposed on cyclic thermal strains. And thus account for a further reduction in life expectancy. So basically what we're talking about is, what is that equation? So you know, you can always put an equation down for everything that's happening around you. So, so you got a strain that's happening because of, I think I did this other day, thermal expansion coefficient E, uh, delta T. So the strain that is being developed due to thermal, the, the thermal strain that's developing, this is the thermal strain. that is developing is due to thermal expansion coefficient difference, maybe delta alpha, maybe there's a delta E modulus difference between the coating and the blade, and then the temperature difference. That's your thermal. And on top of that, you have the mechanical strain, right? So mechanical, if it's elastic strain, all you do is by, right? Uh, what is that, Young's modulus is equal to, I have to write this down usually, sigma divided by epsilon, ep sigma divided by delta E, if that's the case. But this will be E in this case. So, so basically, you're getting those cracks because of that, okay? That's a, that's a typical example you have. Um, Now, when uh, yesterday, uh, Battery Wala, Battery Wala, what is his first name, Rajesh or Ra Rajesh? Rajesh Battery Wala was talking about uh, 